All right, let's um, open to Romans chapter 11. So several weeks ago, I mentioned that many churches and denominations make the statement, we believe in an imminent preterb rapture. And uh, sometimes they just verbally state that, sometimes it's written in their doctrinal statement. And so I mentioned that I wanted to break that down and discuss each part of that statement. So first we discuss the word imminent. And um, we saw, first of all, the, the, the word of God doesn't use the word imminent in that sense. And also, um, I, I believe we saw clearly that the scriptures don't teach an imminent rapture or an imminent coming, um, but rather, uh, and, and we, we went through spent a long time going through all these things, so I'm not going to spend a long time restating everything tonight. But in Romans chapter 11 and verse 22, it says, Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. And so we, we discussed this at length and saw that um, he's talking there about how and when the dispensation of grace will come to an end. And so it, it's dependent upon the response of the body of Christ. And uh, so that being the case, it can't, it can't be imminent because there's something that must happen first. And that is that the body of Christ must not continue in his goodness. And then uh, also turn back to chapter eight in Romans. Romans chapter eight and Jean Gross, did you read verse 25? Excuse me, Romans eight, 25. But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. So we also saw that the, the imminent doctrine teaches impatience. When people talk about, I, I hope it's today, I can't wait, um, so on and so forth. And, and so it teaches, again, an, an attitude of impatience. And we saw that Paul, as in the verse that Jean just read, Paul repeatedly emphasizes patience, waiting patiently. So that's, um, so that's first we discussed, again, the word imminent. Then second, we discussed the word tribulation in that statement. And uh, again, just considering the word, we saw that there is no time period in the word of God that is called the tribulation. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 30. Jeremiah chapter 30, and Dick, would you read verse 7? Unmute here, Jeremiah 30, verse 7. Okay, uh, I have it right here. Jeremiah 37, alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Okay, so a more proper term, instead of calling it the, the tribulation, would be... Um, we can refer to Daniel 9 and where Daniel talks about 70 weeks and that period of time in Daniel 9 would be the 70th week uh, period of seven years. Or as Dick just read in this verse in Jeremiah, um, it's referred to here as the time of Jacob's trouble. So that'd be another more correct term to use for that. And then turn to Matthew 24. Matthew 24, and Richard, would you read verse 21? Was that verse 20? 21, 21. 24 and verse 21. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor shall ever shall be okay so he says for then shall be great tribulation so there 
most certainly is a time referred to in the word of God in which there shall be great tribulation. But again, it's not called, that time is not called the tribulation. It's, it's uh, the last half of the 70th week um, of, in Daniel, or it's the time of Jacob's trouble. Um, and so then we also saw uh, regarding our studies on, on the so-called tribulation, a number of misunderstandings um, in addition to the, the word itself or the term, a number of misunderstandings about that time. So, and again, I won't go through all of that because we've done so already in detail, but we saw, for example, that the idea that many have that the Antichrist will rule the entire world and that people throughout the world will be required to take the mark of the beast is simply not true. There's no basis for that in the scriptures. Um, and we, we identified several specific nations that will be opposing the Antichrist. Okay, then uh, third, we discussed the pre part of the statement. Um, when we talk about we believe in an imminent free trib rapture. And um, in doing that, we saw that when, when people use the, that prefix pre, um, of course, they're referring to, in the statement, it's pre-trib or pre-tribulation, or we would say more correctly, pre-70th week. But they fail to take into account many prophetic events that must be fulfilled before the 70th week that have not yet been fulfilled. And so how do you fit that into the picture? Um, and so, for example, uh, Daniel chapter 11, verses 5 through 20 would all fit into that period. All right, so um, now I want to go on to the final part of the statement, the word rapture. And in, in doing this final part, um, I also want to look at the timing of it. Um, so I want to, as much as possible, I want to consider all of the verses and arguments that are used for or against one view or another. Um, and if any of you want to mention verses or arguments, feel free to uh, email me or text me, and I'll try to be sure to, to comment on that. So I don't, I don't want to deliberately avoid anything. I want to try to talk about it as thoroughly as, as I can. All right, so first, um, again, I want to consider the word itself, so, so the word rapture itself. And, of course, the word rapture is not found in the King James. Uh, and yet there are many who use the King James and, and are very strongly insistent upon using it. Um, and they, But they use the word rapture in referring to what, many of them consider to be a very fundamental doctrine. So I find it rather odd, frankly, um, not only do they use that word rapture, but oftentimes seem very passionate about that word and, and insisting upon that we have to use that word and, and defending the use of it. So in many other cases, they will argue that the NIV or some preacher uses some other word rather than the word in the King James. And so they'll criticize that and say, we should use the word in the King James. But in this case, many again get quite passionate about insisting that we use that word rapture, even though it's not in the King James. So uh, as I've said regarding many topics, why not use words that are found in the King James as much as we can possibly do so? Um, and I'll, I'll explain why I believe they insist upon the use of that word in this case. And, and of course, we, we all use words that are not found in the King James. So I'm not saying that we can never use a word that's not found in the King James. And it's not necessarily a problem to do so. So, for example, if we're going to define some word in the King James, we have to use other words to, in many cases, to define or describe it. So, like, if you don't know the meaning of propitiation, 
And I simply say, well, propitiation means propitiation. Of course, that doesn't help at all. So I'm going to have to use some other words to define that and explain it. So that's not the problem. The problem arises, I believe, when we use words that carry with them a certain theological viewpoint. Um, if that, the, and especially if that theological viewpoint is not according to sound doctrine. So I, I've talked about this before and mentioned some examples, but um, let me again give some examples of why I, I believe some of these words, uh, it's, it's very important to use as much as possible, again, words in the King James and not words that are not found in the King James. So the classic example I often give is the word sovereign. So the word sovereign is not found in the word of God. And yet many, many Christians say that we know that God is sovereign. Uh, many Christians consider that to be a fundamental truth of the faith is that God is sovereign. So depending upon what you mean in the word sovereign, that God may or may not be sovereign. It depends on what you mean by that word. And you can't define the word from the scriptures because it's not found in the scriptures. But that word sovereign, when we say God is, God is sovereign, in almost all cases when Christians say that, they are giving that a, a Calvinist meaning. So the, the Calvinists have kind of taken over that word sovereign. And, um, and, and really the Calvinists have defined what that means. So um, I think somebody might be unmuted. There's some background noise. Um, and so that word, when Christians say God is sovereign, in almost every case, they're meaning that God is in control and he's controlling all the circumstances in the world. But that's not a scriptural worldview. That's a pagan worldview, that everything that happens is done by God or by Satan, that they're controlling and manipulating the circumstances of everything. Um, again, that's a pagan worldview. So. Um, I'm not intending, again, to have an extensive discussion of Calvinism. We've talked about that in the past. But, again, I believe that we should seek to use words and phrases that are found in the Word of God and that can be de defined from the Word of God. And so let me give you a couple uh, re verses somewhat related to this topic um, that if you want to convey something of the idea that God is sovereign, but not use, again, the, the Calvinist meaning um, and a word that's not in the King James. Let me give you a couple examples. So 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and uh, RJ, if you're able to read, would you read verse 21? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21. Um, one verse twenty one. Yes. Hello. Okay. okay. One verse twenty one. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Okay. So if you note this phrase in in verse twenty one, where it says it pleased God. So, God did here what He pleased to do. In the context, the world considers this foolishness, but God doesn't worry about what the world thinks of him. He did what pleased him. And then uh, turn to Psalm 115. Psalm 115. And Dennis, would you read verse 3? Psalm 115.3, but our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. Okay, so that's a very good statement. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. And then uh, 
one more we'll look at in Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah chapter 43, and Dominic, would you read verse 13? Isaiah 43, yes. verse 13. Yes. 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 Before the day was I am he, and there is none deliver out of my hand. I will work, and who shall let it? So God says, I will work, and who shall let it? Or we could say, who, who shall hinder it or prevent it? Um, and of course, no one can. So those are, those are and we could look at many more verses um, on this topic, but those are some verses. Um, so rather than saying God is sovereign, and, and again, almost always when you say that, people are going to think of it in a Calvinist sense. So instead of saying that, I believe it's much more scriptural and, and correct to say, for example, that God does whatsoever he pleases. God does what he pleases. And, uh, and again, we could look at other verses on this, but there's a way of expressing what's true without using a word that's not in the King James. And, and especially again, a word that comes with a certain theological viewpoint, which happens to be an incorrect viewpoint. Um, and so, so, of course, we have to understand the, the context of all these phrases that we have looked at or others that we could look at. But these are actual statements in the word of God, that it pleased God, he hath done whatsoever he hath pleased, and so forth. Okay, then uh, another example I'll give is the word Trinity. And that the word Trinity is used by nearly all Christians and it's again considered a, a, a most fundamental Christian truth that all, all fundamental Christians um, have to believe in the Trinity. But again, that word is not found in the scriptures. And again, that word Trinity carries with it a doctrinal package or, or certain theological viewpoints. Um, and so, again, depending on just what you mean by the word Trinity, it may or may not be true. But again, you can't define from the scriptures what the word Trinity means because it, the word's not found. And so, um, and I believe, and again, I'm not going to talk at length on this topic today, but uh, I believe that many Christians are, in fact, quite confused when they try to understand the Trinity um, and explain um, the Trinity and explain that there are three persons in one God. Um, and so one of the things that comes up with that always is uh, a lot of controversy regarding the deity of Christ. And of course, the word deity is also not found in the word of God. So you know, you're arguing about the doctrine of the Trinity and the deity of Christ, and those words aren't even found in the word of God. Uh, also, often when people talk about God, they say that God is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. Um, and I, I think all of you probably know, but if you don't, um, omnipotent is the idea that, that he's all-powerful, omniscient, that he's all-knowing and on the present that he's present everywhere or all present. But again, none of those words are found in the word of God. So again, I think it's preferable to seek to use a word that is in the word of God. So turn to Romans chapter one. And uh, I'm again going to resist spending a long time on this topic today, but uh, as I mentioned briefly, I, I believe there, there are, in fact, I believe a number of questionable or wrong things that Christians, in that Christians think when they hear the word Trinity. Um, some of them I, I've mentioned briefly already, but uh, I, I believe if you really go through that carefully. Um, again, I think there, it's a, there's a doctrinal package that comes with it, and 
everything that's often meant by that word, I think, is actually not true. So Romans chapter 1, and would Dan or Laura read verse 20? For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So here I believe is a better word to use, and that is the word Godhead. So I, I try not to use the word Trinity, um, but instead to use, to use the word Godhead when I'm referring to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then uh, let's just look at one other place where this is found in Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2 and Sally, would you read verse 9? Yeah, sorry. It's okay. Colossians 2, 9. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Okay, and so there again, you see, uh, you see that word Godhead. And so again, I believe that's a better word, certainly a more scriptural word to use. And, um, you know, just again, I'm going to resist spending more time on this topic now. But for example, uh, when people talk about God being omnipresent, I th I believe what many Christians have in mind when they think about God as omnipresent is, again, really rather a pagan or Hindu kind of a concept of God rather than what the Word of God teaches. So when we say God is omnipresent, God is not in the table or the chair or in the room that you are inhabiting um, or in the, the church building, so on and so forth. God, first of all, God the Father is in heaven, sitting on a throne, and Christ is sitting on the right hand of God in heaven. But when the, the only, the sense in which God is present on the earth today is that he lives in us, in believers. He, he indwells us. But he's not floating around in rooms or in objects and, and all that kind of stuff. And I think many Christians are quite confused about that. Um, in many churches, they will pray the, for, for God's presence to be there and, and that kind of thing. So, again, um, I don't want to get off on that too long. But I, uh, I believe there are, in fact, a number of wrong things that Christians often think when they think of the Trinity. So again, I prefer to use the word Godhead. Okay, then um, some years ago, I, I made the statement that the word rapture is not found in the Bible, which of course it's not. Um, and the person I was that I said this to said, well, the word Bible is not in the Bible. So when I, when I said the, the word rapture is not in the Bible, he said, well, the word Bible is not in the Bible. And that's true. Um, and so rather than defend my use of that word, I decided again, why not use words that are found? And so let me give you a couple examples. Uh, turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, and Meg, would you read verse 15? Second Timothy three fifteen, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, with which is in Jesus, in Christ Jesus. All right. So here we see the word scriptures, and um, there are num quite a number of verses where we find the word scriptures. And uh, then let me give you another example in the book of Titus, Titus chapter two. And Sharon, would you read verse 5? 
Titus chapter 2 and verse 5. Titus 2, 5. To be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Okay, and so here we see the term, the word of God. So um, I, I, I'm trying to get out of my vocabulary for the most part, the word Bible, um, and instead use, refer to the scriptures or the word of God. And uh, as I thought about this, I thought, again, there, there really is a doctrinal package that comes with the word Bible. Um, that and, and the doctrinal package is not true. So, for example, when when pe the way people, including Christians, commonly talk about the Bible, it can refer to any translation. So, in certain churches or Christian organizations, they might say, "Everyone, get out your Bible," and you might have one with the King James and one with the NIV and one with this and one with you might have dozens of different translations. And yet they're referring to all of them as the Bible, but they don't all say the same thing. I, you know, I, I've given many examples in the past weeks and months um, where, for example, with the, where the NIV uses not only different words, but teaches different doctrine than in the King James. So all of these books that people call the Bible are not really the word of God or the scriptures, because many of them have errors in them. And so, um, again, rather than defend the use of that word, I, I'd prefer to try to use a Bible word if possible, uh, or I should say a, a word that's found in the word of God. And in fact, there are words that we can use that would be, I believe, more scriptural to use and that again we can define from the word of god all right so then that brings us to the word rapture again and the, the word rapture also carries with it a certain theological viewpoint and uh, in the coming weeks we will study to see whether or not that viewpoint is true but it does carry with it a certain doctrinal view so the, the word rapture comes from a, a Latin word, and the Latin word means to seize or snatch or be carried away. I'm not aware uh, of any other doctrine where people insist on using a Latin word instead of using an English word found in the King James. So there, and again, there's, it's not necessary to use a Latin word. There are a number of English words that we can use from the King James. So for example, the King James uses the word coming. It uses the word appearing, um, Christ appearing. And in, in the First Thessalonians, First Thessalonians 4, it speaks of being caught up. And so there are a number of other words or terms that we can use that are found in the King James um, and in English. We don't have to go to the Latin. So again, I would say, well, why not use these words? Why not use words that are in the King James? The, the, word, the word rapture in its commonly understood use amongst Christians refers to a coming or appearance of Christ that is separate from the second coming. So there, there are several denominations and churches that don't ever use that word rapture because they don't believe in the doctrinal package that comes with that word. So those who do use it, again, clearly there, there is a doctrinal package or a theological viewpoint that comes with that word. Um, and again, we will study in the coming weeks whether that doctrinal package is true. But I, again, I, I, would, I would rather use words actually found in the word of God 
and then seek to understand and define from the scriptures what those words mean. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so I don't believe, uh, I, I mentioned that I don't believe that, uh, last week I, I mentioned that I don't believe that God can carry out his purpose. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, regarding the prophecies given to Israel during this dispensation of the grace of God, because the fulfillment of the prophecies given to Israel would require that God is dealing specially with Israel as a nation, um, and then also dealing with other nations. But in the dispensation of grace, there's no chosen nation. And, and God is dealing with the body of Christ today, not, not with nations. So, um, so many, and so again, I, I, I do, we talked last week about this statement um, that people sometimes make that prophecy and mystery can't overlap, or some will say can't mix. And again, uh, we talked about last week, depending on what you mean by that statement, it may or may not be true. Um, and so many, many assume that the body of Christ must be taken off of the earth at the same time that the dispensation of grace ends. But I believe those two things have to be considered separately re regarding their timing. Um, if, they, if they do take place at the same time, then we have to prove they take place at the same time. We can't just assume that they, that they have to. And so we've already seen, uh, even a bit earlier today, that this dispensation will end when the body of Christ no longer continues in his goodness. And so I, I don't uh, turn to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3, and would uh, Bonsinger Joyce read verse 21, Acts 3, 21. Until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets, since the world began. Okay, so we looked at this verse last week, but in this verse we see that God has been speaking since the world began through his prophets. And so certainly we can call that prophecy. And then turn to Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16, and would Tim or Jean read verse 25? getting there Romans 16 25 now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began so here and again we talked about this last week but here he talks about the mystery which was kept secret since the world began so again these two cannot be the same you can't have something spoken since the world began and yet keep it secret since the world began. So these two things have to differ. And um, so in the sense of what we just read in Acts 3.21 and then here in Romans 16.25, I don't believe it's possible for God's purpose with prophecy and his purpose with mystery to be carried out at the same time. And, and again, my, my primary argument for that really would be that God cannot carry out prophecy, again, in the sense of Acts 3.21, unless he is dealing with Israel as a special nation and also dealing with other nations. Um, and in this mystery in Romans 16.25, there's no favored nation, and God is not dealing with nations. He's dealing with individuals, dealing with the body of Christ. So I don't believe those two things 
that, that God can be carrying out both of those at the same time. But does that mean that it's not possible for Israel's little flock and the body of Christ to be on earth at the same time? Or are those two different things that we have to consider? And let me just quick um, ha have you turn to Luke chapter 12, because I want to make sure that you all know where I'm getting this term from. Luke chapter 12, and Gabrielle, would you read verse 32? Luke 12, 32. Fear not, little flock. For it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Okay, so this is this is where I get that term "little flock" from, and so um, and we again there are some uh, the Old Testament often talks about a remnant in Israel, so that could also be used instead of a little flock would be the remnant. Um, so the fact that you can't I, I believe you can't can't have uh, prophecy given to Israel fulfilled during this time when uh, during this dispensation of grace does that mean then that israel's little flock and the church of body of christ cannot be on earth at the same time because that's a, a, often an, an assumption that seems to be made but um, in fact there are many passages that make it clear that at the beginning of the dispensation of the grace of God, the little flock was living on the earth at the same time that the body of Christ was also on the earth. And we could look at many scriptures, but um, turn to Galatians chapter 2. Of course, we could look at much in the book of Acts, but um, one verse here will make it quite plain. Uh, Galatians chapter 2. And Pakinatan, would you read verse 9? Galatians chapter 2. Galatians are Galatians. Uh, sorry, Galatians with a G. Yes. And when James, Cephas, and John who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me. They gave, gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship that we should go unto the heathen and they unto the circumcision. So here, James, Cephas, and John, who clearly are part of the little flock, met with Paul and Barnabas. And Paul, obviously, is a part of the body of Christ. Um, so my point at this time being, they were on the earth at the same time. And in fact, here they met they met with one another. So, um, and the members of the little flock, and there, there's some, sometimes some controversy about this also, but uh, I believe it's very clear that the members of the little flock never became members of the body of Christ. So for example, Peter, James, and John, never became members of the body of Christ. As long as they lived and even after they died, um, they still hold to the promises given to them of a kingdom on the earth centered in Jerusalem. And their hope is still all of the material and spiritual blessings that will come with that kingdom on the earth. And so that they never changed the, the promises that God gave to them or what their hope was. But they were not removed from the earth, even though a new dispensation had begun. They still continued living on the earth until they died. So that doesn't prove that the same thing must happen at the end of the dispensation. Um, that's something we will have to study. But it does prove that it is possible for the body of Christ to be on the earth at the same time that the little flock is on the earth, and yet the two remaining separate churches with separate promises and, and separate instructions. Um, 
And so there, there are a number of, uh, uh, turn to, to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. There are a number of uh, opinions or views on exactly when the church, the body of Christ began. And I'm not going to try to delve into that today. Um, but the first time, uh, historically, the first time that we find mention of the body of Christ is in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And would Dan or Lisa read verse 27? So 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 27. <clears throat> That there should be <clears throat> that there should be no schism in the body, but the members should have the same care for one another. Um, chapter twelve, verse twenty-seven. Oh, the wrong, I read the wrong verse. Yeah, sorry. My bad. Now that you are the body of Christ and the members in particular. Okay, and uh, the verse you read, verse 25, also mentions the body, but verse 27 says the body of Christ. So again, historically, this is the first time that term was used, that the, the term the body of Christ is used. So clearly, when Paul wrote 1 Corinthians, the body of Christ existed. And when did Paul write 1 Corinthians? And I, I won't go into length about how this can be concluded, but turn to Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19, and George, would you read verse 22? Acts chapter 19, verse 22. So he sent into Macedonia two of them that ministered unto him, Timotheus and Erastus, but he himself stayed in Asia for a, re for a season. Okay, so when, when this verse says that he himself stayed in Asia for a season, this is when Paul wrote 1 Corinthians. And so um, clearly, again, when Paul wrote 1 Corinthians, the body of Christ existed. But then look in chapter 21. So George just read in Acts 19, where, um, where Paul wrote 1 Corinthians, then turn to Acts chapter 21, and um, Akun, would you read verse 20, Acts chapter 21, verse 20. Acts 21, 20, and when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous of the law. Okay, so again, Paul wrote 1 Corinthians and mentioned the body of Christ in Acts 19. But here in chapter 21, we see that there are thousands of Jews which believe, and they're all zealous of the law. These would be members of the little flock. So um, again, you can see definitely that the body of Christ was on earth at the same time that members of the little flock were on earth. Okay, then there also are a number of opinions or views about when the dispensation of the grace of God began. And again, I'm not going to get into that today, but turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and um, verse 17. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. So historically, again, this is the first time the word dispensation is used. And Paul says here that a dispensation of the gospel was committed unto him. Uh, and again, Paul wrote 1 Corinthians in Acts 19.22. Um, and so again, it's clear 
that there were members of the little flock on the earth after the new dispensation had begun. So again, we can't argue. Uh, and so again, I, this doesn't prove that the same thing has to happen at the end of the dispensation, that the two groups have to be on earth at the same time. But we can't use the argument, which I've heard some use, that they cannot be on the earth at the same time because it already happened. It already happened during the Acts period that they were both on earth at the same time. So we can't argue that a dispensational change requires that God has to move, has to remove the believers from the previous dispensation uh, from the earth, because that's not, not what happened in the book of Acts. And so um, in the coming weeks, I want to look at this, this topic uh, in more detail. And I'm trying to uh, think about exactly how I should go about covering it. One, one idea I'm thinking of is just start at the beginning of Romans and go through Paul's epistles in order uh, and talk about all of the verses or passages that uh, so far as I know are used to argue one thing or another and then uh, try to look carefully at those verses and passages and, and see what they say. But um, I'll, for the time being, that's kind of what I'm thinking about, how I'm thinking about approaching it. But, uh, and, and then I'll, I also want to, along with that, um, try to include any arguments that people give. So a couple arguments we've already talked about. Last week, we talked about the argument that prophecy and mystery cannot overlap. And again, that is true or not true, depending on what you mean by that. Um, and we talked tonight about the argument some give that these two groups, the little flock and the church of body of Christ, cannot be on earth at the same time. And we see that's not true because they already were in the book of Acts. But uh, anyway, I'll stop there for today. So thank you all. Thank you, Dan. Hi, Jean. Hi, Good night. Man. Good night. <laughs>